Okay, for today's classic interview, we're going back to an awesome interview I did with Michael Mann um, three and a half years ago about the real impact of climate change. And I am completely sick of this narrative that there is a debate as to if and when climate change is going to become a problem for humans on the planet. It's a problem now. And Michael Mann talked to us about that back in December of 2015. What he said then is particularly relevant now as everything he talked about has accelerated. And there is no more sort of when is it that we will be able to identify the real world effects of climate change? They're happening now. Michael Mann knows it. Uh, our audience back in 2015 knew it. And we're going to go back to that interview today with Michael Mann. Michael Mann is distinguished professor and director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University and also author of two books, including Dire Predictions, Understanding Climate Change and the hockey stick and the climate wars. It's so great to have you on. And uh, the, the book really uh, presents in sort of ordinary, uh, straightforward language, the important findings of what is currently happening with the, the climate crisis on Earth. I would love to start at the broadest point possible with regard to what predictions we can make and predictions people may have heard about the future of the climate crisis. Uh, people sometimes hear, oh, the entire East Coast will be underwater or all of the ice will be melted and the polar ice caps, et cetera. And sometimes it sounds a little bit hyperbolic. So let's break it down. What are the real concerns with regard to what we can predict will happen as a result of continued climate change? Uh, thanks. It's good to be uh, on the show with you. Um, so if we continue with business as usual, uh, burning of fossil fuels, uh, if we don't take uh, precautionary actions to deal with our uh, increased uh, ongoing emissions of carbon into the atmosphere, we will likely see uh, between 7 and 9 degrees Fahrenheit warming of the globe by the end of the century. Uh, now, that won't, uh, you know, it, that doesn't mean that the, the entire U.S. will be submerged uh, below the ocean. Um, uh, it means that uh, there will likely be enough sea level rise to uh, force us essentially to retreat from many of the uh, major coastal cities uh, of the U.S. and elsewhere around the world. Uh, it will mean that uh, many of the problems we are already seeing, uh, damaging impacts of climate change related increases in extreme weather, um, wildfires, droughts, uh, flooding, all those things that we have seen already um, uh, worsened uh, uh, weather uh, events because of the impact of climate change will get that much worse. Uh, if we, again, continue with business as usual burning of fossil fuels uh, by the end of the century, we warm the planet by 7 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, arguably the rates of change that we will see in our climate will exceed our ability to adapt to those changes. On the and other I'm hand, curious, Michael, as far as the temperature change, you know, we, you talked about the sea level rise that we would see. What the if if our oceans were warmer also, would that not have a significant impact on ocean life and thus the entire animal ecosystem? Yeah, that's right. Uh, in fact, uh, right now we have a major El Nino event going on and it sort of gives us a glimpse of the future because during El Nino's often uh, sea surface temperatures are around uh, the, the world are much warmer than they would normally be. And with those large El Nino events, like the one we're seeing right now, uh, we often see massive die-off of corals. We see uh, uh, an, an event called uh, coral bleaching, where uh, corals, they lose their color because the symbiotic organisms that give them that color um, literally, literally flee. But the, the corals can't move. They're stuck. And uh, if that goes on, uh, long enough that kills off the corals. Uh, that is combined with the effects of uh, ocean acidification as we increase CO2 in the atmosphere, the oceans become more acidic. So all of these things are impacting uh, ocean biota, coral reefs. Uh, this is part of the reason that climate change represents a major threat to uh, ocean biodiversity, uh, to fish populations, and our ability to continue to feed ourselves uh, through um, uh, fishing. I would love to hear a little bit from you about uh, how our audience can uh, tackle when they are on the receiving end of what to me sounds like a tired old talking point from so-called climate skeptics or, or non non science believers, as I like to call them, that, hey, listen, 
humans on Earth, we only have observations about temperature from a very tiny slice of the history of our planet. And there's really no way at all to say that the, the changes in temperature we're seeing today are any more than just cyclical temperature changes. We've had ice ages and it logically follows. We also have warmer periods. We only have a little bit of data. That's a very common talking point. We hear from climate skeptics. What can our audience have sort of in their arsenal to refute that? Sure. So I will respond to that particular talking point. But uh, it's often very useful to draw upon resources that exist out there. Um, there is a site called skepticalscience.com. And if you go to that website, they have a list of the hundred or so leading climate change denier talking points. Mm -hmm. And the scientific responses to each of those talking points at the introductory, intermediate, and advanced level. Fantastic. And, uh, and even better than that, you can download the whole thing onto your smartphone and have it at your <laughs> fingertips. So, you know, at that Thanksgiving dinner where that cantankerous uncle that you have who always right. comes armed with, uh, you know, you've, you've got that at your disposal and you can respond to him in real time. Uh, but uh, with that particular talking point, um, it's actually combining a number of myths. Uh, first of all, it wouldn't even matter um, if the current warmth that we've seen, whether or not it's unprecedented, um, the reason for past periods of warmth is understood. The reason that uh, you know the temperatures were so warm during the early Cretaceous period when dinosaurs roamed the planet, that was because of very high CO2 levels, a very high greenhouse effect. And that happened naturally over tens of millions of years due to natural variations in the concentrations of these greenhouse gases that have to do with things like plate tectonics. So those changes happen over a time scale of you know, it's a hundred million years if you go back to the early Cretaceous period. What we are doing uh, by burning fossil fuels is literally taking all the carbon that got buried in the ground after that period over a hundred million years and we're putting it back up into the atmosphere but over a time scale of a hundred years, a million times faster. So it's the rate at which we are modifying the atmosphere and warming the planet that is cause for concern, not whether or not there might have been past periods uh, periods in the distant past that were, that were as warm. One other thing, we do know that the recent warming spike is unprecedented uh, going back into the last ice age and probably back more than 100,000 years. There are various lines of uh, paleoclimate evidence that we can use to piece together the puzzle of how the climate changed in the past. And those data tell us that the recent warming spike um, is likely unprecedented in tens of thousands of years, maybe more than a hundred thousand years. So it is unusual. And the CO2 concentrations that we've reached already are higher than they've been in millions of years. We know that as well. And Michael, how drastic do human activities on Earth have to change to really make a dent in the impact that we're having? You know, sometimes I'll read about a new initiative. For example, uh, we could move 30 percent of New York State's electricity consumption to renewable and and green alternative energies uh, on a per capita basis. And I'm thinking per capita, our population continues to increase. We're talking only about 30 percent. It seems like 10 years from now, any benefit that we get from doing that is already going to be undone by our population growth. Um, is my sort of uh, uh, pessimism or feeling overwhelmed by the, the magnitude of what we have on our hands here justified or can we really make a dent in this? Yeah, I think it's a little overly pessimistic. Um, population in, in the U.S. isn't uh, climbing. Uh, uh, it's uh, population uh, in developing nations um, that uh, continues to climb. But when demographers look at sort of the large scale trends uh, right now uh, with global population, they estimate that we'll probably plateau uh, by the middle of this century hmm. at about nine billion people. So yes, there will be more people. Right now there are about seven billion people. But that's not going to continue on an uh, exponential trajectory like it has in the past. It appears to be plateauing out. Uh, now can we provide uh, energy for those people without the continued burning of fossil fuels? That's the real challenge. And you know, you mentioned uh, you know the the possibility of New York generating 30 percent of its electricity from renewables. Well, Germany's already doing it. Germany is doing that. Uh, the, if you look around the globe, if you tally the total uh, global electricity use 
we are now up to about 22% of our electricity generation globally hmm. coming from renewables. So there has been a dramatic uh, turning of the corner just over the past few years um, in you know, moving away from burning of fossil fuels, moving towards renewable energy to generate electricity. We've got a lot farther to go, but last year for the first time ever, for the first time in many decades, we saw global economic growth without any growth in carbon emissions. Right, uh, and we, we reported on that, that extensively, and that, that seems to be a really yeah. important indicator of where things could go with the right decisions yeah. made, is it not? A absolutely. It, it suggests that we're turning the corner. Now, we're not yet turning the corner fast enough to stabilize those greenhouse gas concentrations below dangerous levels. So it's going to take a lot more work, but uh, there's reason for cautious optimism. We are already beginning to turn the corner. Well, any conversation about climate change where my view is unnecessarily pessimistic for me is a win. You know, I mean, that's uh, that's good news for sure. I'll remind our good audience we've been speaking with Michael Mann, distinguished professor and director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. Check out his book, Dire Predictions, Understanding Climate Change. Thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure talking with you.